And for you, like on that note, so I feel like a lot of kind of mainstream Western analysis does hinge on of these armchair psychoanalyses of Putin or other forms of moralizing. And, you know, I think he's most often billed by the Western liberal media and westernized liberal elites in Russia as like a, a madman or a kleptocrat. And I'm curious, setting aside those psychoanalyses and moralizing, like what are his motivations? Like if you had to explain in your own words yeah. to a Western liberal audience, yeah, well, um, I mean, you know, what would you, is he would... crazy or rational? I guess, I mean, surely his actions yeah. must have a rational basis because, so, you know, you, I'm looking at all these takes that are like, well, you know, he's Scott Adams. Well, he's a he's a drug addict, which is he, why he called the Ukrainian, um, you know, forces drug addicts. Um, he's <laughs> somebody said somebody offered up a, a, a take that he was like suffering from uh, long COVID, which mm-hmm. uh, really ramped up his uh, delusion and aggression, like that kind of thing. But strategically, right, he wants Ukraine because he doesn't want there to be NATO affiliated troops there because it's on russia's border well i don't know what you call a person who puts two hundred thousand troops on the border of a country and then invades and then indiscriminately starts killing people in that country other than a madman but wait, when you say i mean is it indiscriminate i well certainly the shells that are being rained down on kiev are pretty indiscriminate the, sure, the rockets are counter- we defending putin here i mean are we saying that he has like a reasonable rationale to attack a country no 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 i'm did ukraine ever <laughs> no. did ukraine ever in its entire history <clears throat> attack russia ever for that matter has nato in its history ever attacked russia i mean wow. we're talking about hypothetical um situations mm-hmm. that could potentially happen in the future and therefore right. he needed to preempt um what was going on in ukraine and launch this violent bloody war in which p- maybe three four thousand people have died already mm-hmm. in the first two days what's uh, what did we say about the bush administration when it launched a preemptive war of that kind uh, mm-hmm. over the supposed threat of weapons of mass destructions in Iraq. I mean, I don't think we were very happy about that. So no, when this the is shoe, why I got the wine. When the shoe, <laughs> when the shoe is now on the other foot. Yeah. Okay. We can't rationalize. But it's not on the, the actions that he's done through some kind of hypothetical threat that he felt was coming in the future. That's not a justification. But is it a, what I'm asking is, is it a hypothetical threat when, you know, NATO is absorbing like Warsaw Pact countries when they're at his doorstep, as like uh, many commentators have mentioned, you know, most recently, like Glenn Greenwald went and Tucker Carlson and made that argument. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I, NATO clearly doesn't want Ukraine. I mean, look what's look what's happening with. Uh, I think. What do you mean? Oh, NATO doesn't well, want NATO Ukraine. doesn't want Ukraine. I think, but but I think like the, the very kind of establishment idea that you see in the media is that um, this was an act of unprovoked aggression, and it's certainly an act of aggression that's like condemnable on many fronts. But unprovoked, I, I don't know. Well, I, is a country of its own free will joining a military alliance when it is nearby a? provably aggressive country an act of provocation is wanting to be in a defensive alliance uh something that should provoke russia well i mean it depends also you know there's a lot of talk about right like the Zelensky government being captured by american corruption so you can see i guess you can rationally see without coming out as a total putin supporter which i am just kidding i'm really not um (laughs) well uh, biden's been going on and on about how yeah Putin was going to attack Ukraine. And then all the, you know, the uh, Taibis and the Tracys then had to write these things where they were like, yeah, yeah. we were wrong. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What I got wrong. They were like, is they were like, no way is Putin going to do it. Um, but Biden was saying that. I don't know. From Wait, my, so, so his, I feel because like because Biden <clears throat> said that Putin was going to attack Ukraine. It's his fault that Putin attacked Ukraine. It's, it's not his fault, but it definitely feels like he kind of goaded him into doing it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, 
yeah, mean, there was some I, larger you, geopolitical you, you, pressure that yeah, yeah. exerted yeah. On, on Russia that, that made their situation kind of if, um, if, if, impossible to go back from. Well, if Putin's, cal- if Putin's rationale for attacking Ukraine was in order to push NATO back, then he's really miscalculated because now the Swedes and the Finns are like right. banging down NATO's door and asking to be let in. Okay. And I think the same thing happened with countries that uh, joined NATO uh, subsequently to the uh, 2014 invasion. Mm-hmm. I mean, when Ukraine overthrew uh, Viktor Yanukovych uh-huh. in 2014, um, Ukraine was a neutral country. Viktor Yanukovych had no mm. plans to uh, enter uh, the NATO alliance. Anna's okay. making a skeptical sound. <laughs> well, I mean, not only was it a neutral country, well, it wasn't in the sense that it was it was neutral from the perspective of Russia, but you could argue that it was actually not neutral because it was pro-Russian, because uh-huh. it was being it was run by a guy who uh, supported Putin and was backed by Putin. Uh-huh. And the the thing that sort of initiated the Crimea annexation, which was the first aggressive step against Ukraine that's ever been taken by anybody in its independent history, um, was the fact that uh, Yanukovych was about to sign on to a European Union trade agreement, which was perceived as a first step not to joining NATO, but to moving towards the European Union. Well, let me me ask you about a, you know, purely kind of hypothetical scenario. So obviously, there's a, a lot of questions about whether Ukraine would have even entered NATO and or whether that was like kind of wishful thinking and you know maybe it was unlikely back then impossible now but recently somebody speculated to me that the the only way now that Ukraine could join NATO is if it defeated the Russians what I do think you make of that? I think that's right I don't think that uh, anybody in NATO is seriously thinking about allowing Ukraine into the alliance because uh-huh. NATO doesn't want to accept countries that have border disputes because that exposes them to having to defend those countries in the future. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that there's really any chance <clears throat> for Georgia, the Republic of, or Ukraine um, to get into NATO because both of those countries now have massive border disputes with Russia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels like there's a lot of so the sort argument of, that Ukraine mm-hmm. was imminently going to become a part of NATO is false on its face anyway. And, and the rationale... Well, that's, that, not, that's, that's not the argument, I guess. What's the argument? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm unsure. But I, I, I think that there is a lot of sort of borderline hysteria on the right about NATO whenever there are these Eastern European conflicts. But the sadder truth of it is that, yeah, NATO doesn't want anything to do with these um, shithole countries like (laughs) Ukraine and Belarus. Um, Um, And they sort of use them as uh, geopolitical pawns in um, a wider conflict with Russia, which is mm, how what this seems like to me. Yeah, but I mean, the thing is, Ukraine Ukraine didn't have any NATO aspirations uh, before Russia attacked it. Um, Ukraine wrote into its constitution... The Mm. idea that it wants to be part of the European Union and that it wants to be a NATO member after Russia's annexation of Crimea Mm -hmm. and after the establishment of these uh, separatist proxy entities in the east of Ukraine that are Mm pro-Russian. So, you know, it's like one thing follows on another, not the other way around. And so Putin doesn't get to argue that because... NATO's trying to push Ukraine into its alliance. I get to do whatever I want and kill people. No, of course, of um, course not. What What do you think Putin's ultimate objectives are? The total annexation of the Ukraine without possibly, you know, with the exception of Galicia, um, securing the Donbass, yeah. uh, disabling the NATO hardware, quote, you know, but what do you think in your mind are his ultimate goals? Um, as we say in Russian, programa maximum, you know? Mm-hmm he'll take whatever he can get. It's not about what he wants. It's about what he can get away with. I mean, if he had his way, I'm sure that he would want to reinstate the Warsaw Pact all the way up until East Berlin. Um, But he's obviously not going to get his way because these countries are now in NATO and he doesn't have that option anymore. Mm -hmm. In Ukraine, it's the same thing. You know, does he want to leave a rump Ukrainian state Mm -hmm. that's sandwiched between Poland, Belarus, the Russian controlled areas of Ukraine and Moldova. Um, I, if if that's where the Ukrainian defenses stop him, then yes. 
Uh, but if the Ukrainian defenses melt away, he'll march all the way to the Polish border. I'm sure of it. Why wouldn't he? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't think there's some kind of a, you know, it, it's it's like, it's not like if all of the Eastern European countries hadn't joined NATO, that Putin would have spent, you know, the last two decades engineering peace and prosperity in the world. Um, it, the people who are arguing that this is a sort of natural reaction to NATO expansion are ignoring the fact uh, that Putin is a person who has been incrementally enlarging Russia's territory uh, for his entire uh, tenure as president and prime minister of Russia. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is there a rational basis, right, for his actions that I think there is a rational. Not no, no. I think insane. the. There, I yes. think there is a rational basis. It's called imperialism, right? He wants to resurrect some version of mm. the Russian Empire. Um, but whether, that's a rational but basis. That, yes, but increasing some... Russia's increasing Russia's influence uh, is an end goal in and of itself, and I think always has been. Okay, so okay, let me ask you. This so it's imperialism, that. regardless of of who's doing it. Of course. I mean, if you're trying to go to other countries okay. and make them part of yours and control other cultures and languages, then you're an imperialist. You don't get to... Uh, well, I mean, in the Ukrainian case, Ukraine is, you know, has like a minority Russian population, right? And there's, I think, the majority still speak the language. And there, maybe you can comment on his comments during his, um, I think it was the first of his addresses to the nation where he did cite uh, outside of the kind of the obvious explanation of NATO, you know, breathing down his neck, these kind of de-Russification efforts Mm -hmm. um, in the Ukraine. Um, (laughs) De-Russification efforts in Ukraine. That's funny. This is, I think his, that's what it was his wording. Yeah. Yeah. I People speak Russian freely in Ukraine, Mm -hmm. always have. Right. And probably always will. The thing that's happened in eastern Ukraine over the last eight years of them being controlled um, by the Russian proxies is that it's become impossible to speak Ukrainian there. Mm-hmm. Um, not only has it become impossible to speak Ukrainian there, uh, but uh, other religions which uh, used to flourish there have not been tolerated. I reported on a series of Protestant churches in eastern Ukraine that were viewed as suspicious by the Russians and the pro-Russia forces well, that, <clears throat> that were totally taken over, their property Protestant. expropriated, and their believers kicked out of the region. Mm. So it's kind of, you know, the pot calling the kettle black when Russia tries to... How accuse. did prots get over there? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, that is suspicious. <laughs> How did, what do you mean, how did they get over there? I mean, there's plenty of Protestants in Russia as well. There's Protestants everywhere. After the wall came down and after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, people became free to... Um, they thought that made more sense than being Orthodox or Catholic. A lot of them did, yeah. Okay. Um, and I think... You, <laughs> 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 nothing, nothing. I okay. Mean, I'm not, I'm not saying, saying they I'm should be saying, ousted from the region. I'm just saying it is a little suspicious that there would be an outcry the <laughs> Protestantism. I don't. I'm not saying I want to be Eastern Europe. I'm not saying I want to be a Pentecostalist. I'm not saying I want to be a Baptist. But like, if that's you know your vibe, that's then a Western trash. I'm all for it. Like, that's do West, you do you? That's Western trash. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't want it in my country if it was up. If it was up to me, but so, okay. I was just. I, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but when the city of Slavyansk was recaptured by the Ukrainians in 2014, I was at the exhumation of a mass grave there and um, witnessed them take out four bodies uh, of men from the local Pentecostalist congregation um, who had been carjacked by the pro-Russian forces and then executed on the spot because they had nice cars. Mm -hmm. And they were targeted outside of their church, which was then expropriated. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't an isolated incident. Like These sorts of things were happening uh, all across uh, the East in the areas that were controlled by the pro-Russia forces, and the same things happened to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. So I'm not saying it's just the Protestants. I mean, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church suffered as well. It's just not 
as many um, followers of Ukrainian Orthodoxy in Eastern Ukraine as there are Protestants. Mm-hmm. But but why did they have nice cars? What were they hiding? Um, what were they hiding? Yeah. I think they were hiding the <laughs> fact that. Uh, Where'd they get the cars from? NATO. Yeah, you, you know how you know how uh, th- these uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and various different Protestant movements they put an emphasis on uh, community and supporting each other and business. Wait, I thought Protestants well. were into austerity. Like iconographic austerity, right? Well, I yeah, mean, their churches are certainly their, yeah. their churches are certainly very plain. But there was there was like this feeling among certain elements in eastern Ukraine that the Protestants were doing too well, mm. and that they had these businesses, and that there was sort of some jealousy towards their success. And so when they came to power and took up arms. These were the people that they targeted because they had the nicest churches with like these rec rooms and these large mm-hmm. screen TVs and, you know, like a, a stage and, and games and gotcha. musical so, instruments. So it's like a case of like <clears throat> coveting thy neighbor. But, you know, aren't there similar reports um, from Western Ukraine about Ukrainians terrorizing Russians? And, you know, you can always go kind of like tit for tat and like dredge up uh, evidence of atrocities on, you know, any side. Well, I, I'm, I won't go as far as to say that there weren't some uh, atrocities that were perpetrated by the Ukrainians, but the fact of the matter is is that Ukraine, for now, remains a place where you can speak Russian, mm-hmm. and you can speak Ukrainian, and you can go to a Russian Orthodox church in the center of Kiev, and you can go to a Ukrainian Orthodox church in the center of Kiev, and a Protestant church, or a synagogue, and the areas that have been controlled by the Russian proxies, that's not possible. Mm-hmm. So there is a difference, right? In one country, you can, in one part of the country, you can do things that aren't allowed in the other part of the country. And it just so happens that the place where you can't do it that's run like North Korea is Eastern Ukraine in the Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic. Mm-hmm. Self-declared. Okay. <laughs> 